In this video, I want to take the inverted F antenna that was designed and uh, milled out in previous videos, take that and measure it and tune it. If you look closely, you can see that, and I described this previously, that it was over milled in some of the areas since it was not exactly flat on the milling machine when it did the copper rub out versus a copper isolation. You can see how the uh, tip of the razor knife kind of stops before it hits the copper and then right here it stops also. This is showing that this area is milled out a little too deep and this is a little deeper than the uh, trace is. So there's several areas where there's too much dielectric removed and that's going to affect the resonant frequency of the antenna. Uh, make it a little higher than desired but that can easily be fixed by taking and extending the electrical length possibly retuning the impedance by adding or removing copper on this uh, shunt uh, stub right here. So I'm going to calibrate the network analyzer. I've got it set from 1 gigahertz to 2 gigahertz. I changed the uh, log mag scale for the return loss to uh, get a little bit finer uh, resolution 5 dB steps and then you know have another 5 dB step above the top line just to so we can see if it goes above uh, zero dB that would indicate any sort of cal issues and then Smith chart display on the bottom uh, and I've got uh, Mario microwave 3.5 millimeter male on the test port on the short cable coming off the VNA and then I've got a Mari uh, short open and load so we're going to do a salt cal on here I like the Mari standards uh, they're ruggedized 3.5 millimeter that's a topic for another video but uh, uh, obviously compatible with SMA, but the important thing is you want a good 3.5 millimeter reference plane for your calibration, even if you're going to be hooking it up to an SMA. One thing to always do on the network analyzer if you're not worried about speed, more worried about accuracy, is change the sweep uh, sweep setup right here. You can see we're going from 1 to 2, 201 points linear, but go over here and change the sweep setup. Uh, select step sweep. What that's going to do is take and uh, stop, hold the network analyzer, wait for the synthesizer to settle and the ALC to settle. Uh, it's going to change it so it, it goes to the dwell time instead of trying to sweep as fast as possible. This is kind of important, especially when you're doing long cables or devices with high group delay or doing measurements in the chamber. Uh, anechoic chamber say antenna measurements. I've seen lots of people have issues when they didn't realize they weren't on step sweep. So by default you ought to turn it on all the time for everything unless you're worried about speed for like production measurements then you turn it off and try to measure as fast as possible but I always like to leave it on. So I'm ready to do the calibration now. I'll go to calibration wizard. I'm going to select unguided. Uh, this is a full Mari kit I've got. It's got a fixed load and a sliding load. Uh, the breakpoint between the fixed and sliding load is 1.999 gigahertz. That's the default for their Cal standard lists. Uh, probably I'll change that to like 2.001. Uh, since we're going to 2 gigahertz, if I did the smart guided Cal, it would ask for the sliding load for that last point. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to select unguided and then I can manually select the standards. It's going to be a one port. Uh, Cal, uh, select the Cal kit, 8050H, it's already in there. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and cook, connect the open. Let me go ahead and click that. It's going to say connect calibration standard. And then we need to hook the open up first. So I'll take and uh, pull that cap off. When you put these things on, you never ever want to rotate the standard. This is a Genomari 3.5 millimeter precision. If you take a look at the female, conductor in there it's a slit so when the male goes into it, it expands slightly that downside is that changes the characteristic impedance slightly makes it a little lower the HP precision ones have a solid conductor it's not split and on the inside there's little uh, fingers that grip the uh, pin on the male side so when the male goes into it it does not expand it gives you a more precise characteristic impedance but it's a lot more fragile if you look at the HP kits you'll find most of them will have the fingers torn out that's from people rotating them or hooking them up to SMA connectors you never ever want to hook a calibration standard up to an SMA always use 3.5 millimeter these 3.5 millimeters jack savers as I call them uh, let me go ahead and torque this thing before I forget. Okay. 
Anyway, the Amari makes a set of metrology grade jack savers. Uh, this is a male female. This is a C model. Uh, they ha also have male male and female female. They're all phase matched to one another. So let's say you have a dut that has two male connectors on it. How do you do a cowl for that? That's insertable. You can't. So uh, unless you do adapter removal cowl, it takes two cowls. But what you can do is do a insertable cowl, meaning one port's male and the other port's female. Uh, use this adapter and then swap this out for uh, the uh, female female side. And since they're phase matched and the amplitude is very close between them, you don't have to do that adapter removal cowl. It so saves time. Also, this is a, a eight pounds per inch Mari torque winch. When you're uh, torquing it, you always want to grab it by the little end right here to get the proper torque. And then this wrench right here, I make these up. This is a uh, six inch crescent wrench and I grind down the tips on a bench grinder and these will nicely fit the flats on an SMA bullet connector and they're also nice for doing cowls because these standards, all the flats have different dimensions on them. So now that that's torqued, I can go ahead and uh, click uh, measure the female open and then click OK. It's got that acquired. Now I can pull this one off and do the uh, short Again, always keep it steady when you're pulling it off and always finger tighten it until you get to, to that last uh, where it needs to be torqued. So now here's the uh, short. Put that on. Uh, it's also good to clean these periodically with dry gas. I use a, you know, a compressed, compressed uh, duster and then maybe some swabs with alcohol to clean them out and also gauge them. I have a gauge kit 3.5 millimeter that checks the depths of the pins in the female pin, male and female pin to make sure that they don't have an interference fit. Okay, uh, this is ready now. I can click that. Port 1, this is going to be the female short. Click OK and that's done. And I can take off the uh, short circuit. I did not turn averaging on this cowl. I usually do that. Usually set the averaging to 16. On the old 8051s, you could actually turn the averaging on and off in the middle of the cowl. Not 8051, 8510C analyzers, 8510 series. You could turn the cowl on and off in the middle. Turn the averaging on and off in the middle of the cowl. You can't do that on these analyzers. Uh, typically, though, I like to turn averaging on and turn it off during the measurement, but this is a little bit more precise cow. If you're doing isolation cows, you definitely want to turn the averaging on and set it for a very high number of averages. So now the uh, load is on here, fixed load. And let me torque that. This load's a little wonky. This is loose right here. It doesn't matter. It's just a protective cover. I need to put some hot glue in the end and get that or just put some tape around there to, to get it uh, secured. And now this is where we're going to have a 3.5 millimeter female fixed load. You can see, yeah, here we go. Now that's done. No, we're not going to say the instrument states. Now the cowl's done. So now you can see the uh, uh, Smith chart has impedance has uh, gone to the uh, center of the chart because we've got the load on there. But that doesn't tell you that it's a good cal that because it's reference to this load impedance. So it's always going to be good if this load impedance were not 50 ohms and it would still show you know a good impedance match. That doesn't necessarily mean the calibration is good. And now you can see now that the uh, that the uh, thing is open, we're getting a little bit of uh, capacitance right here due to the uh, open pin inside the uh, disconnected male end. Now I can uh, take and uh, put the antenna on there. I'm just going to finger tighten this. I'm not going to torque it. You can see I've got a marker 
1575 megahertz. So this thing is actually a little too high in frequency. And uh, of course, I want to hold it off the table. You can see if I push it down on the table, it's going to lower in frequency due to the dielectric of the uh, anti-static mat right here. But you can see it does, even though it's, it's higher in frequency than we want, again, likely due to the extra dielectric that was removed uh, that obviously we didn't count for in the simulation. Uh, but you can see it does have the proper impedance that we're going a little bit on the, the locus is going a little bit on the outside of the center point of the Smith chart. So that's going to give us a, a broader impedance match, you know, uh, if we had the locus, you know, curving around and going, not encompassing the center of the chart, you know, we'd be, uh, have the same mismatch at uh, center frequency, but uh, we'd have a lower overall bandwidth. So the goal was to take and encompass the center of the chart, and we've got that. So now we just need to take and uh, lower the resonant frequency of this thing to get it on frequency to 1575. It looks like it's about, uh, I get another marker on here. And see, I go to marker two. Looks like right now it is at uh, 16, what is that? 16, 1.7 gigahertz approximately, so we need to get it down by, what, 125 megahertz, but we can uh, lengthen the end right here and uh, bring that down. You can see if I touch the end, it's uh, very sensitive. This is a high voltage end right here. So any capacitance that we add from this down to the ground plane is going to affect it or just add a little bit of electrical length right here to lower this resonant frequency, but the impedance looks good right now. So I've got this uh, antenna now suspended on a couple of pieces of styrofoam about two inches off the table. That'll give me a decent surface to, uh, you know, uh, solder the thing and, uh, and uh, press on it. Uh, you can always tell when there's antenna engineers because they'll take and grab, <laughs> grab styrofoam out of the hallway. I do that myself if I see someone unpacking something and, uh, boy, that's a nice piece of styrofoam you got there. Don't throw that out. You know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So, uh, but what, I, what I've taken, I've taken this little strip of brass shim, shim, shim stock, which is about one millimeter wide, and uh, I used plenty of flux and got it tinned. And I'm going to be able to take and put that on the edge of this thing now and see if we can tune it lower in frequency. I'm going to add the, uh, see if we can get uh, data onto this analyzer. Let me find the button right here. Uh, let's see here. Math. Here we go. Data memory. Memory on off. So now we can have a reference point of where we started and uh, where we need to get to. Again, marker 1 at 1575 megahertz. So I can take and move this onto here. It's kind of difficult because I'm not looking through a microscope. I'm looking at the PC screen on this webcam app. Take and get that manipulated onto there. There we go. And then use a golf tee. These are very handy dielectric stick down pins. Now you can see it's moved down to much lower than 1575, but the impedance still looks good. So I can take and solder this on here and then take an X-Acto knife and start cutting on it until we get to the right frequency. So now I've taken and soldered this piece of shim stock onto the end and you can see on the analyzer that it's lowered the frequency. So I'm going to take and uh, take the data memory again and now we need to start trimming it until we can get back to 1575 megahertz. So I'll just take and trim a little tiny bit off right there. Press down, trim it off. You can see we've moved closer. Trim a little bit more off. And it's kind of hard to see since I'm not working under a microscope. Take a little bit more off. A little bit more maybe. And we're right about there. I'm not going to take any more off because we're right at about 1575. Uh, return loss could be a little bit better. I'd like to have it at 15 or so or better, you know. Uh, but I think that's probably sufficient. To change the return loss, we'd have to start messing with this side right here, perhaps adding on more uh, copper right here. See if I take and uh, lay down my X-Acto knife at the edge here we can increase the return loss or de you know, decrease 
S11, depending on how you want to say that. But uh, my guess is if I add a little bit of copper right here, I can get that to uh, get that a little bit better. Now, what I forgot to mention is, uh, you know, I, I'm sitting on two inches of foam, but this antenna is naturally grounded, so we don't have to worry about uh, static uh, electricity problems, you know, destroying the network analyzer. If you do have a network analyzer with uh, ports that have built-in bias T's, it's wise to take and put take a uh, banana jacks and put uh, 50 ohm shunts on there your banana to BNC and take a 50 ohm shunt put that on there so you've got 50 ohm terminations at DC so that will you know especially have an analyzer that's hooked up in anechoic chamber since uh, most chambers have foam walkways which generate extreme amounts of static electricity so that's a good thing to do to protect your analyzer now I've got this uh, another piece of shim stock right there so I'm going to try to I'll just take the razor knife and see if I can manipulate that let me let me take and save the uh, the data the memory so now we have the memory trace and let's see what happens I take that shim stock and kind of move it over try to get it on the edge again this is very hard to do looking I'm used to working under a microscope About like that. And we'll take and press down. That improves it slightly. Need to ma maybe add more. Yeah, that's better. It's gone from 11 to what, 13? We need to add a larger piece on there. I'll maybe cut another piece and see if we can get a little bit larger. All right, so what I've done is cut another piece of shim stock. You can see this one's longer, about the length of the uh, end section right here. I'm going to try to manipulate that onto the uh, end. What uh, what we need to start doing here is, you know, we know we're off in resonant frequency. That needs to be lowered. We don't need to actually know the impedance to do that. But now it's nice to be able to uh, actually measure the impedance directly. We're measuring return loss. Impedance is it calibrated because the reference plane is back at the input, you know, it's essentially back at the SMA connector face. Uh, we need to take and move the reference plane ideally right to here. We could take this and throw a uh, short circuit across here, but that is really not a short circuit. If I take these two uh, tweezers, take this tweezer and spread it out, you can see I've got what well, could be a short circuit, but the issue is that the line, the the uh, lead the lead frame or the uh, shim stock is about uh, one millimeter wide, so that's about actually smaller than the 50 ohm trace width. So that's going to give some inductance, uh, and we actually can't get a good short anyway. If you go back and I think watch video number two that I did that talks about. Uh, short circuit standards for TRL Cal, you really need a good short circuit to get a uh, reference plane for a microstrip line since we're not terminating the full uh, wave on the line. So, you know, the, you, can, you can do this, but it's never going to be as accurate as having a good TRL uh, calibration standard. But I think we can get away without having to actually get a good impedance measurement and just manipulate this and get it on the line here. We want to widen that line. So now if I take this uh, golf tee, get it on or you can see that it's decreased the uh, decreased the uh, uh, return loss. Looks better so I'm going to take and solder this on here now. And, and we'll probably have to take and uh, tune the thing with a razor knife. So now I've taken and soldered the uh, shim stock right along here and trimmed it up so we're just widening the length of this line. You can see that the uh, uh, impedance, the return loss has improved now. It's 14 dB, not quite at 15, at 1575, but dips below 15, a few megahertz above that. So I think I'm going to leave this as is. You can see with, because uh, we, we don't want a perfect return loss. You know, we're again trading off bandwidth for return loss. And uh, things such as dielectric loading, you know, I take my finger and put it close to there, you can see it's going to lower the resonant frequency. So we're not going to gain very much. If you think of it in terms of mismatch loss, 
you know, you're not going to gain going from a from a 14 D to be a 20 DB. You know, maybe you're going to pick up one DB, DBI and antenna gain. Uh, you can calculate what the mismatch loss will be from a calculator, but uh, but we're going to trade off some. You know, so in its natural free space state, we want to be able to have a little bit worse return loss. So when it's loaded, it gets a little bit better. So you can compensate for the inefficiency due to loading by dielectrics by increasing the uh, return loss sum. Uh, same goes for loading it with uh, metal. If I take this right there, this uh, piece of PCB stock, you can see that. Obviously, we're getting excellent return loss right here. But we're probably decreasing efficiency because the near fields are coupling into this copper plate right here. So uh, we will uh, trade that off and, and, uh, and get some... Uh, get some little bit you know keep the gain more constant when we load it so i think this is good and ready to be tested with a gps receiver